There are few more gruelling sporting examinations than cycling's Tour de France. 23 days, three and a half thousand kilometres. Every pedal stroke a challenge of mind and body. A brutal test of a man's physical and mental fortitude. Cadell Evans is well used to being pushed to the limit and beyond. His life's been that way for almost two decades. First as a teenage mountain biking prodigy, then as one of the world's premier road cyclists. No other man has ever been ranked world number one in both disciplines. But it has been a long, winding and often painful road to get to the top of those mountains. And his journey still continues. Cadell's story, an Aussies Abroad special, starts now. As an only child in a remote area of Australia's Northern Territory, Cadell Evans spends his early years miles from his nearest neighbours and therefore needing to make his own fun to while away the time. His bike is therefore much more than a plaything. It is a portal to a world of adventure and freedom. Certainly, independence and freedom uh, as a youngster, it's, that was the only way I had it. And growing up in life, it still gave me that independence and freedom. And, and now it still does today, even though it's my profession. He would just disappear. He would just jump on his bike and just take off. Um, it was always really difficult because he, he would disappear and you'd never know which direction he went. So the dog would always follow him. So I'd just call the dog and wherever the dog came from, that's where I'd go looking for him. He did have to make his own fun, he did have to entertain himself and so yeah, he was always quite independent and you know, the bike was part of that. Cadell and Helen relocate to country New South Wales with the family horses. Cadell suffering a freak accident at the age of eight that leaves his life hanging in the balance. It was just one of the foals I got in the way when it was a little bit excited, it was just getting, I was just bringing it in to get fed and it got a bit excited and it clipped me literally clipped me on the ear with its hoof, and, um, but being eight years old, I didn't resist it. Cadell's skull has been crushed by the impact of the kick, a piece of his skull impinging on his brain. Unconscious and struggling to breathe, he's rushed to Newcastle via Medivac helicopter as the paramedics work feverishly to save his life. He undergoes emergency surgery two days later, doctors fearing the worst. It was terrifying. He was in a coma. The best prognosis at that time was that he would be paralysed down one side and, but you know, they didn't really know what the outcome would be and um, it was a very difficult time. Cadell awakes after more than a week in a coma and begins his slow recovery to health. He will need to wear a helmet to protect his damaged skull as he works to regain his balance and his strength over the next 6 to 12 months. I'm really lucky to be here today because it was just one of those little freak accidents that happens and um, yeah, really, really fortunate to survive it. I had such uh, muscle degeneration from being still for so long that um, I had no muscular strength, no fitness. I used to go, used to go shopping, I used to get a, a stitch just walking down to the shops. But over time, Cadell regains full health and enjoys a normal life as an energetic youngster. He and his mother moved to the outer northeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Cadell reconnecting with riding as he spends hour upon hour riding his bike around the local hills, becoming interested in a new emerging sport called mountain biking. Sometimes I look back at it and think, one, like if my father didn't buy me a mountain bike at age 14, what would I be doing in my life today? He was pretty good, so that became more and more what we did on the weekends was going to bike races and, and him training a lot and yet yeah, sort of turned more into a discipline than freedom I think. Just, oh, just being out there in the forest, the aspects of it, doing downhills and the whole freedom and independence thing just appealed to me again. Cadell seeks out races in the local area, jumps on his bike, rides to the race, competes, then rides home again. He's ideally suited to the sport. Compact and lightweight, yet powerful and gifted with an extraordinary aerobic capacity that allows him to maintain maximum effort long after his competitors have begun gasping for breath. 
However, his rapid rise through the Australian junior ranks to win the 1993 National Cross Country title is not based on natural gifts alone. Everything was just geared around well, what do I have to do to, to be a professional cyclist or a professional mountain biker, but particularly um, what do I have to do to do it, I'm going to do it and yeah, that I gave up nearly everything. I sometimes wonder what my, my school friends and things thought of me, some would ask me, oh come out and do this and have a party or whatever, oh no, no, you know, I've got to get up early, meet, meet the group to go riding or I'm doing, going to a race or travelling away for the weekend. My life was, it seemed to be school, training and sleeping. I came about into mountain biking you know, at, at a good time. It just became introduced to the Olympics at age 19. I went to Atlanta Olympics. And so I look at this. Five years before, I, I was competing in my very first mountain bike race in a real small club level. Then all of a sudden, I'm in the debut in the Olympic Games. Mountain biking had a real big uh, sp growth spurt. And Cadell is at its forefront. The young Aussie, a rising star in the fledgling sport, winning national titles and world championship medals on his way to the 1998 and 99 World Cup titles. His time in the AIS program is also exposing him to road cycling. Cadell cross-training with the road cycling squad and showing a natural aptitude for this form of the sport as well. I enjoyed racing on the road. I was a big fan of the Tour de France. I used to watch the Tour de France on TV and follow, follow the road racing and some of the road riders. The team thing also was appealing to me after all the years of being mountain biking. It's very, you get out of what you put in, but also you're, you're sort of on your own a lot. Because I was racing on the road a lot uh, for training, when I came to make the transition to become a road rider in uh, 2001, 2002, it came a little bit quicker than, than it did for other mountain bikers. Ahead on Aussies Abroad, Cadell Evans, after eight successful years as one of the world's finest mountain bikers, it's time for a new challenge. But Cadell's about to find out just how brutal Grand Tour cycling can be. I'd never been in a state of fatigue like that and I didn't know if my body was completely exhausted. When I you know, hit the wall, blew up, and it was um, not an experience I'd want to wish upon anyone. It really was <laughs> horrible. two-time World Cup mountain biking champion, 24-year-old Aussie Cadell Evans has decided to switch gears and pursue a new career in road cycling. His first Grand Tour is the 2002 Giro d'Italia. Cadell arriving at the Tour as a domestique, a support rider for the powerful MAPE team and its lead rider Stefano Garzelli. But when Garzelli is disqualified for a positive drug test just six stages in, MAPE needs a new lead rider. Suddenly, the young Aussie, riding in his first ever three-week event, is thrust into the spotlight. Look at Cadell Evans. Oh. He is not going to lay down arms, you know, Phil. This young man, he wants to become the first Australian ever to win this bike race. He moves into the race lead a couple of days later and holds the coveted pink jersey, entering the Italian Classic's final major climb. A scenario unheard of in the world of professional cycling. A two hour race to a three week race, it's a, it's a big change physiologically to make and a change normally you want to, to allow your body four or five years to do. Four or five months I had to, to turn things around, wasn't quite enough. It was only six or nine kilometres of the last climb of a, a 3,000 kilometre race that I came to the end of my fuel. No matter how hard you train, no matter what other races you do, one day races, mountain bike races, road races, it doesn't condition you for that level of fatigue. So you go there and you don't realise how tired you were and that's what, for me, what was my problem was I just, I'd never been in a state of fatigue like that and I didn't know if my body was completely exhausted or it was just normal and it turns out I was completely exhausted. As a sporting experience it was fantastic and as a chance of winning a Giro it was a good, a good opportunity lost. Cadell finishes 41st that day. The tour lost, but an enormous amount of respect won. A young rookie rider carrying his team on his shoulders who refuses to submit, instead pushing himself beyond his physical limits and into a hell he's never experienced before. That in itself shows that Cadell Evans has what it takes to become a world-class Grand Tour rider. It's such a tactical sport, road cycling. How long did it take you to get a handle on that? Yeah, there's 
so many different aspects and so many different situations and how the, how the other riders react that dictate the outcome of the race. You're still pedalling a bike, but you have to learn all, also your whole new group of competitors who you're racing against, their strengths, their weaknesses, when they're at their weaknesses, when they're at their strengths and so on. And that, that, that took a while to learn. Was it more frustrating or challenging along um, the way? Or a bit of both? Sometimes it was frustrating being at a high level with a base of fitness and things that you come from mountain biking and then sometimes for what seemed like a simple mistake to make you lose a race. But also on the other side of things, everything was new. It was a whole new fresh environment. It was a whole new motivation. And at 34 now, I'm still enthusiastic and, and I love it because really I've only been in the sport for not even 10 years now. Cadell's remarkable debut at the 2002 Giro has drastically accelerated his learning curve and the expectations placed upon him. But his natural talent and intense work ethic see him rise rapidly through the ranks. And by 2005, he's ready to tackle the sport's holy grail, the famed Tour de France, which he's been eyeing off since his teenage years. A good friend of mine who was crazy about the tour, but his family didn't have a television, so he would come around to my house every day to watch it, watch it on TV at my house. And of course, I started watching. Oh yeah, in Jerain Le Mans. No, oh, this is pretty good. I think it was my mum who asked me shortly after, oh, "What would you like to do as a cyclist?" And I remember answering it. I was deep in mountain biking. Oh, I think I'd like to ride the Tour de France. Thirteen years later, that I started my first Tour de France, and on the tour, you can't believe how people are. They're all just crazy about the whole race and the whole ambience that that creates. Everything around it is kind of, to me, it's a bit of a distraction from the race and I sort of like, can't we just focus on racing our bike and enjoy racing our bikes as well as we can. Has it been frustrating over the years that people don't just kind of, not leave you to your own devices exactly, but don't necessarily have a empathy for the riders and what they're going through and the gruelling nature of it that those little five second sound bites when a rider might turn around and be seem a bit snappy it's because they've just ridden 300 kilometres and they're hurting and they're sore and they're tired and they're frustrated yet people will form an opinion of gee kid Levin seems like a grumpy bloke even though they've never met you. <laughs> That's um you're the kind of guy you're the kind of journalist I like to speak to at the tour because maybe you understand that it's um everyone has a job to do at the tour and my job as a rider is first of all to ride a good tour you cross the finish line and the moment there people expect you to be coherent for one and, and available and what do you mean you're not talking to us? We're TV, we need this. <laughs> Your head's spinning and you, you don't know you don't know even what's you can't even contemplate what's just happened in the race and what's gonna to happen tomorrow and you're getting all these questions. It takes a bit of getting used to, that's for sure. Do you feel you have been misunderstood over the years oh, because oh, of that? Certainly it's been difficult to manage sometimes the attention and things that come to and and yeah people base their opinion on you and they see you for two seconds. Sometimes I've even been provoked. I was injured at the tour and trying to ride to the start line and people see you've got a blood patch on your pants so they stick their thumb in in your gauze or something that you've got under under your shorts. All I'm going to do is go to the start line and not get in pain. My reaction hasn't always been the most diplomatic that's for that's for sure and yeah that's something that you get to you have to get used to and adjust to and sometimes yeah for that reason I like to just try and focus on racing my bike. And it's a strategy that has clearly worked for the Aussie at Latour. Cadell finishing an impressive eighth on debut in 2005 and then fourth in 2006. He arrives at the 2007 Tour as the most consistent rider in pro cycling and enhances that reputation with three weeks of smart solid Grand Tour riding. Cadell riding into Australia's public consciousness in the process, finishing just 23 seconds behind Spain's Alberto Contador to become the first Aussie to podium at La Tour. 23 seconds is kind of frustrating, but at the moment you do what you can and um, I came from, I think it was 153 behind to 23 seconds to win. I needed a couple more seconds to win, but um, didn't quite make it, but in the end it was sort of 99.9% .9 of what I had. Cadell has become one of cycling's biggest stars, claiming the 2007 season-long Pro Tour title to become the number one ranked rider in the world. Expectations are higher when he arrives at the start line for the 2008 Tour de France, and entering stage nine, Cadell is well-placed, sitting second overall. But when a Spanish rider falls immediately in front of Cadell midway through the stage, there's nowhere for the Aussie to go. He lands hard, incurring serious ligament damage in his shoulder and deep bruising across his back and down his left side. I was injured and having a tough time, but I was there close to the wind, so of course I'm turning myself inside out, still trying to win the Tour de France, but I wasn't in physically the best shape and um, 
yeah, it was one of the hardest days on, on a bike in my life. Once again showing his remarkable mental strength, Cadell climbs back in the saddle, finishes the stage and 24 hours later holds the yellow jersey as tour leader in an incredibly gutsy performance. However, the injuries will ultimately take their toll. I was around 85, 90%, so I had to find this extra 10 or 15% from somewhere. I didn't have it in my legs, which means you have to find, find something up here to push yourself a bit more, and that made it, for me, a, one of the hardest tours, probably the hardest grand tour that I've ever ridden. For the second consecutive year, Cadell finishes within a minute of the tour winner. 7,000 kilometres, 42 stages, and a total of just 81 seconds between he and two Tour de France titles. Then in the 2009 Vuelta, Spain's great tour, a puncture and a badly botched repair by neutral race mechanics will cost him 1 minute and 33 seconds. He'll end up finishing 1 minute 32 behind the eventual winner. As mentally tough as Cadell Evans the rider may be, it's enough to leave Cadell Evans the man questioning his destiny. I always believe that you get back out of the sport where you put into it. When they put me out of the chance for the win of the Vuelta there for the puncture and everything, I did actually start to question and you know, I'm just like, man, I don't deserve this and I, what, what more can I do for this sport for fate to deal that, dish that out to me? I was like, what do I do? And Chiara, my wife, had always said to me, oh, you know, un giorno sarebbe giustizia, un giorno sarebbe, one day there will be justice, one day there will be justice. Ahead on Aussies Abroad, Cadell Evans, justice is served. I didn't know if I was, um, you know, in a, in a dream or riding down that final road there something that many, many, many cyclists only, can only dream about. Aussie cyclist Cadell Evans has been agonisingly close to winning all three of cycling's Grand Tours. Yet for all his consistency, many in the cycling world are beginning to think of Cadell as the perennial bridesmaid. Good enough to contend, but not quite good enough to win a big one. The puncture fiasco at the 2009 Vuelta has even left Cadell questioning his own misfortune. But there's little time to mope with the World Championship the very next week in his own backyard, Mendrisio, Switzerland, just a few kilometres from his adopted hometown of Stabio. After 255 kilometres, and with just seven remaining, it is all or nothing time for Cadell. He takes a deep breath, clicks into a harder gear, and attacks. Just that one, one attack there, seven kilometres from the finish, turned the whole cycling world around for me, and uh, it was behind the scenes a really tough year. In the end, I only had a, had, only had a few people believe in me and help me get through those bad moments. Wife, coach, manager, just a few people, a few people on the team who, who, who believed in me and stuck by me and then you know that was as much a victory for them but also for me and of course yeah, when you win that, win that jersey there everyone believes in you then but um, it's in those tough moments where you really need that support and, and those people get you through and they'll remain for me for the rest of my life. People help me, help me get to that victory. And that was uh, yeah, still the single most incredible sporting experience of my life and riding those few kilometres down to the finish line on my own. The finish line was about two and a half kilometres from my base and nearly nearly every day I'd ridden home from training I'd ridden, I'd ridden along that same road to ride there in front of the whole world's behind you. You've only got the finish line, the rainbow jersey at the end. It was oh, yeah, surreal to say the least. More than 30 seconds clear, he has ample time for an exuberant celebration but instead issues a simple tribute, a touch to his heart and a wave to the left, the direction of his home. After 15 years as a professional cyclist, Cadell Evans is finally a world champion. Now I look back at it and think, well, oh, geez, I'm glad I stuck it through in all those bad days. I've seen him so close, particularly in mountain bike races, at world championships and just missing out, flat tires, those sorts of things, but that was, perfect it was just perfect like any job it has its good days and its bad days but the good days the highs are very high but on the bad days the lows are very low in those moments there you're just like wondering why the hell am i doing this
in the end, yeah, when you have a great day, you win the world championships or you win at the tour or a grand tour or a big one day race or something. It's, yeah, it's fantastic and everything falls into place and it just flows. Shortly after becoming world champion, Cadell shocks the cycling world by leaving the powerful Silence Lotto team for the smaller BMC Racing. It was all about to have, a, to have a good team around you for the tour and be supported. That's important on any level, but also um, for me a big part of it was being uh, just improving quality of life because my um, my sport is so much such a big part of my life. And when you're uh, when you're surrounded by good, good people and you can enjoy that much more, and a state of mind's greatly improved. So yeah, starting off there in BMC, new new environment, new motivation, and uh, yeah, new yeah whole new environment to be in. He really is professional, not only with his bike as well uh, with his environment. So the part which I can play along him, the PR side or the media stuff, he likes to know everything. He takes care about the details and probably these uh, skills or these habits makes him strong as well on the bike. How well known is he through Europe? It's the 10th season as a pro on the road, so uh, they know him. They know him from his past and like in, in the Benelux countries, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, he rode for Team Step there. And as well in other countries like Switzerland, France, where as well mountain bike is quite uh, famous and popular. In Italy, he is a star. All over the place, it's Grande Cadel means hey, the big Cadel is here. So the people, they really know him and they love him. You ride somewhere like 40,000 kilometers a, a season. A lot of those are by yourself. What are you thinking about when you're out on the road? I'm trying to focus on doing good training most of the time, but um, you know, obviously I think it equates to more than a thousand hours sitting there pedalling, pedalling a bike. Sometimes you do get a bit distracted and um, you look at people's gardens and the flowers that have come out or the nice restaurant that you should probably come back to one day and uh, or the nice view, but um, the main thing's doing the training and doing it well. People around you say that you've always had an amazing ability to, to deal with pain. Do you ignore it or do you tolerate it better than others? I think it's um, something that's inevitable. Sooner or later in life we're going to have to tolerate it. And um, But I think like anything, you get used to it, you get better at dealing with it and and you, um, yeah, you have your little ways of coping with it. What part does fear play in your sport? Many aspects, I think. Um, what I notice of not just in our sport, but a lot of sports, one of the biggest driving factors is of really successful individuals is fear. Um, fear of not winning or fear of losing or fear of fear of not being the best they can be or something. And then um, oh, certainly um, you know injuries and crashes and things but um, yeah with experience like a training your strength, training aerobic conditioning, training a skill, it's dealing and confronting these things, it's something you learn with experience. What does it take to be successful in this sport? combination of many things, mostly motivation, good people around you, a good team around you, on the road, in the car, the support car, but also in your, uh, in your life as well, because the team aren't always going to be there when you're banged up in hospital or having a real tough mo moment. Just try and do the best you can, because better than that, what can you do? And then, then you have to question yourself, well, what's the best I can do? What am I capable of? And that normally for me is how I measure success. Ahead on Aussies Abroad, Cadell Evans' The Road to Glory. Cadell's preparation for the 2011 tour hits a snag when a training crash sidelines him with a knee injury. I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit worried. Everyone says, oh, you've got time, you've got time, but um, I'd like to be able to be training a bit more and training better and more time to recover. Plus, the more training you miss out on, just as soon as you start training, the more risk of uh, re-injuring re yourself, so um, it's a little bit of a... A little bit of a test of patience. It's mid-April and Cadell Evans has been forced to take three weeks out of his schedule to leave the team and rehabilitate a knee injury. For a man as meticulously prepared as Cadell, this unexpected glitch is creating some anxiety. His new daily routine, an early morning trip to the physio near his home in Switzerland. So Cadell, why Stabio? I think it's the most Italian city 
it's in Switzerland, almost Italian eyes, two kilometres from the border, but it's, um, yeah, we become quite attached to our little town, and then by chance they had the World Championships here one year, and by chance I won them. That, that helped. That helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that helps. Uh, that helps with your uh, foreign residency status. And of course, your wife is Italian. Yeah, so she's Italian. So it's um, we live in Switzerland, but we live at one. I think it's 1.3 kilometres from the border. So from from Italy. So it's kind of bizarre having to take your passport when you go to buy a pizza or an ice cream or go training. But it's um, yeah, it's it's a great place to live for a bike rider because it's of the better weather and. Close to, close to the international airport, good roads, lakes, mountains and everything to train on. But um, you're in Switzerland and living in Italy, everyone likes the sound of living in Italy, and oh, wouldn't that be great? It's a very well organised country. So, it's, so Switzerland's got all yeah. the sort of romance and flair of Italy, but it's uh, a little more organised. Almost, yeah, yeah. Switzerland, I think you have the best of both worlds. You have the, the good organisation of, of, of Switzerland, the country, everything works, everything everything works well, but um, living so close to Italy, you also have all the good food and the good people, and I have my in-laws nearby, and so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, mix of, a mix of the, the best of both worlds. So we're going to see your physiotherapist, Cadell, yep. is this a man that you see often? Yep. this is unfortunately of recent time, I've spent a lot of time with this physio. Um, yeah, the orthopedic surgeon and the physio, um, they're great people, but I don't know what I'd like to see, them. it usually means there's something wrong. Um, Every seven, six days a week we've been coming here uh, in the last three weeks, which is a bit unfortunate, but um, oh, when you need help, you really need it, and uh, fortunately I've got some good people around me when I get into trouble. So it came from a, a crash? Yeah, just a stupid, cra stupid crash. I was out training on my mountain bike, actually. And, you know, just a, it was just a bruised quad at the start, and then you know, we found out the bruising went right through to the bones. So it's, been, yeah, it's been really... 19 days now, which training's been compromised, but um, but um, uh, that's the way it goes sometimes, unfortunately. Of course, I've got good people here who can look, at, look after me and help me get better soon. With knee injuries, it's just one tiny little thing wrong, and with all the repeated movements, mm. every pedal stroke, if you do 70 pedal strokes a minute, <laughs> three, four, five, six hours a day, obviously they're a, a, small, um, a small problem just becomes amplified. Talk us through your training regime, firstly on the bike, the amount of hours that you clock each week, and then what else do you do away from the bike to keep your body So yeah, healthy? yeah, the, like the main part of, of cycling being an aerobic sport is volume of volume of training and then of course you have all your intensities which which you do and, and, and also the duration, but a typical training ride might be four or five hours. Specific intervals, climbing on the flat of varying intensities and to, yeah, to give a general idea, a five hour ride you might have a Start, start training heart rates like 120, 130 beats a minute up to sort of five, ten minute efforts which might go up to 180 beats a minute as well. To ride for five hours isn't, isn't actually hard when you're used to it. <laughs> to ride hard for five hours... It's amazing is, what you can get used to. Pretty, yeah, it's pretty hard, so, and that's, but that's where your form comes from, where getting ready for the big races is, is the, not just the intensity that you do also on one day, but to do it every day, but also that's recovery from one day to the next becomes more and more important and that's why you have to look to other parts of your training like massage and good recovery and just just a good night's sleep is actually a little bit underrated in sport these days but actually one of the most important important aspects is just good quality rest and then um, yeah I work a little bit with um, with the physiotherapist and strength training and so on and that's that's always for injury prevention and so on so so that takes up yeah a little bit of time but um, Certainly it's the hours on the bike, 30 hours on the bikes, that's a big week of training. Do you get sore? Um, or is your body just so used to tuning out your the miles? Your body away? normally gets pretty used to it, you get tired, your uh, backside often gets a bit sore. <laughs> but um, the, the, main, the main thing is um, just, the, just the fatigue and also it's, you know, it's raining or something, go outside, go outside five hours and do all the climbs or something. It's, um, yeah, mentally it requires a, a good bit of motivation, but, um, you know, I have my goals and my program and the goals to work towards and you know, program the training and everything around that and, and you know, try and try and fit everything in day to day, week to week and to, to arrive at the specific events as, yeah, as best as you can. And every year you plan it all out and then you get injured or something and you have to remake it. Not, not every year, but um, this year we found um, what we're finding me as I'm, because I have so many years 
already in my legs that it's actually taking less and less training to become better, which is kind of good because I can, on a little bit of training, I can race at a high level. Less training that you do at the start of the year is more energy you've got for the races at the end of the year, so you have to you have to use that to, to your advantage. So part of the, the overall puzzle of winning something like the Tour de France is all the work that goes into leading up to the starting line. It's not just what you see in the race itself, it's the months oh, of preparation yeah. ahead of it. And certainly you, you want to arrive there at your best level, but it's not like you're going to be at your very best for three weeks, but you just want to be at your very, very best for the last 10 days. Does winning the Tour de France now mean more or less to you after you won the World Championship? I'll wait, wait and see how the outcome of the Tour goes, but certainly one or two more Tours I think even two is not unrealistic with the way things have gone. My age, I'm getting old. They tell me I'm too old to win the tour. I don't believe them. They told you you're too old to win the world championship as well. <laughs> yeah, they've told me a lot of things that, that, I, that I wouldn't be able to do in my in my career as a cyclist that I didn't believe. Um, for, certainly, certainly to give everything and, and see where it goes. And certainly, I certainly hope that please just just one tour, and let the stars align for me instead of someone else, please. Cadell's determination to do everything right in his rehabilitation pays off when he returns to racing by winning the Tour de Romandie. He will once again arrive in France as one of the Tour favourites. But can he finally convert favouritism into victory? Everything we could have done, we had done. Every, um, we, we ticked all the boxes, you know, we'd, we'd really prepared for it well and you know, we'd had hiccups and interruptions all along the way. And, um, but yeah, on the start line, I was like, okay, let's see what we can do. The most noticeable thing about the opening week of the 2011 Tour de France is BMC's permanent positioning at the front of the peloton. Led by American veteran George Hincapie, the team is working hard each day to ensure their lead man, Cadell Evans, is safe and secure at the head of the pack. It was an interesting tour from, the, from day one. Very competitive. You know, Cadell was second on the first stage, second on the second stage. He, you know, he, he, he won a stage a couple of days later and, you know, it was just boom, 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 boom all the way through. A lot of people criticized us for the, in the first week for doing too much work. Um, but if it meant Cadell didn't crash, people started understanding why we were always at the front, why we were always together. A lot of people did not like to see that, but we're not out there to make friends. You know, we, we, we want to try to win the Tour de France and that means staying together. The guys were, um, I called them the dream team from about day three. Afterwards, people started to say, well, that's a pretty good team, that's a pretty good team. They were just, really, they were incredible, and I can't, I keep saying it, but I, it's just the way it is. They were incredible, they set me up in the perfect position. Every day that I spoke with him, he was always quiet and happy, and I never spoke to him one day when he was nervous, he was really quiet, having a good time with the team, and everything was, was planned and everything was ready. We had a good time, uh, even from the beginning when the when people were crashing and lots of stress. At the end of the, the stages, we'd laugh and joke, and that's important in a race like the Tour de France. It's so hard mentally and physically that you know once you're not racing, you put your mind on something else and really just try to uh, enjoy the people that you're with. Every day we had a careful plan to follow, and um, yeah, every day our plan kept working. So we just stuck to the same plan and, and kept at it, and um, you know. Not all the crashes were, uh, were, were behind us, some were in front, some were beside, some were very close and so on, and, um, but it was really, um, you know, limited our, our risks wherever, wherever it was possible. We had a plan and we stuck to it. And BMC's aggressive plan is working perfectly. Cadell successfully navigating the expected chaos of the opening two and a half weeks to be squarely in contention entering the final few days of the tour. He trails race leader Thomas Vokler by 1 minute and 18 seconds, entering one of the tour's most crucial days, stage 18, the legendary lung-busting climb to the highest stage finish in race history at Galibier. With 60 kilometres to ride, Andy Schleck makes a successful breakaway. Cadell frustrated by the reluctance of the yellow jersey group to join him in a concerted chase. With 10 kilometres remaining, he trails Andy by more than four minutes, his tour dream suddenly in grave danger. So Cadell takes it upon himself to lift the tempo and close that gap to Schleck. There are a couple of uh, occasions on those days where 
just for a moment it was like, oh no, don't tell me, it's not slipping away. Did you have any of those feelings when someone made a move on you, you had the bike problem and you had fell behind, you had to catch that time up? Um, a lot of those moments, and not just those that you saw on TV. <laughs> there was a lot of those moments, but um, you know, stay calm, get on with the job, do what we have to do. Gandhi and Frank did everything they could do, um, if you like, to make Adele look the best bike rider in the race because they attacked him all of the time when they could. They followed every piece of drama on that chase through the valleys of Cadell to try and get back up to Andy Schleck before the climb of Alpe d'Huez. Nearly 20 years I've been racing a bike and uh, the stage to Galibier where Andy Schleck was in front, I think I put um, nearly all 20 years of experience into that last 10 kilometres there. It was a terrific day of bike racing and, uh, and the world appreciated it. You know, the viewing figures around the world hit record heights. Uh, not just in the English-speaking nations. Uh, this was a tour which gripped the imagination. Somehow Cadell musters the energy and the will to pursue Andy Schleck to the summit of the Galibier, halving the gap and reducing the overall damage. In 10 kilometres of agonising climb, Cadell Evans has kept his Tour de France chances alive for at least another day. The fact of the matter is when, when Schleck went away and uh, alone, it was really Cadell that saved the race not just for himself, but for the rest of the riders. They stayed on his wheel as long as they could. Um, and in, in the end, he, he, he limited the damage. Again, every day was about limiting damage and controlling situations. And, you know, sometimes the team can do that, but at, at certain moments, it's, it's up to Goodell, right? It's up to him to do it. So nobody else can do that for him. Andy Schleck's bold and brilliant ride has slashed Thomas Vogler's lead to just 15 seconds, with Cadell 1 minute 12 seconds back. The following day, stage 19, sees the field tackle a short but testing ride to Alpe de Huez, punctuated by three steep climbs tailor-made for attacking. With only the individual time trial to follow, Andy Schleck realises that this is the day he has to break the Australian, given Cadell is the superior time trialer of the pair. Three-time tour winner Alberto Contador attacks just 15 kilometres in and Andy Schleck takes off after him. But Cadell has come to a screeching halt at the critical moment. A mechanical problem with his rear wheel necessitating a bike change and costing him the best part of two minutes as Schleck accelerates away into the distance. Are the cycling gods about to strike Cadell Evans down once again? So in those situations when things are potentially going bad for you, it's obviously important that you're spending every ounce of energy into the pedals as opposed to stressing and worrying about what might or might not happen. Yeah, you only have a certain amount of energy and uh, my, my thing at the Tour is if you can get all of that energy onto the results board, particularly in the overall of the race, that's, uh, that's, that's how I judge how good race or not. Despite feeling fatigued from the previous day's exertion, Cadell sets off in pursuit of Andy Schleck. The 2011 Tour de France could well be decided in the next hour of racing. Unless you, you race the Tour de France and you know what it takes to win a Tour de France, uh, you know, it really takes a phenomenal, um, you know, superhuman athlete. And uh, sure, myself and uh, the rest of the Pro Peloton, we're great athletes. You know, we do uh, above and beyond uh, what, what is uh, asked from our, from our bodies. We, we take it above the limit, but someone like Adele, you know, is a, is a special, you know, once in a hundred year kind of type of rider. There's half a dozen riders that can do what Cadell can do in the mountains. And so uh, when, when, when he's there, you know, sometimes he has to do these things himself. And he did it that day. Cadell ultimately leaves his teammates behind as his relentless effort steadily closes the gap and he eventually catches and passes Schleck. For the second consecutive day, Cadell Evans has defied the odds and defied the cycling gods hauling back another potentially crippling deficit to keep his tour dream alive. Schleck has taken over the race lead and holds a 57 second advantage over Cadell entering the final competitive stage, the individual time trial. History shows the Australian to be a significantly faster time trial. But after two gruelling days of solo chasing, how much does 34 year old Cadell Evans have left in his legs? Time trials are a funny thing, and you, you don't know in your own mind how well you're going to ride a time trial till you're about a kilometre into it. Then the body tells you, I'm up for this, or I'm not going to do it. It really came down to the wire. You know, even though we knew Cadell had a better time trial than, than his uh, competitors, you never know what's going to happen. And the days before that, Cadell had to do a lot of work. Um, so it was exciting. All those years of hard work, all those hundreds of thousands of miles, 
all that pain, injury and sacrifice. For Cadell Evans, it all comes down to 55 pressure-packed minutes on the streets of Grenoble. That's next, as our Aussies Abroad Cadell Evans special continues. The cycling world holds its collective breath, awaiting one of the most gripping finishes to a Tour de France in history. Three weeks of racing has come down to a 42 and a half kilometre battle between two of the world's best riders. Australia's Cadell Evans, who finished second in the 2007 and 2008 tours, versus Luxembourg's Andy Schleck, who finished second in 2009 and 2010. Half a world away in Australia, the clock has ticked past 1am. Yet an entire nation is glued to their TV sets, nervously hoping and praying that their man can finally fulfill his lifelong dream. Yet the man himself is remarkably composed. I sat in the back of the bus, listened to Paul Kelly, I think, on the headphones and sat, waited, and a bit of, you know, just watching the weather conditions, seeing what's happening, changing equipment in the last sort of, leading up to about the last hour, hour and a half, and just finalising the last few details, and then got my bike, did my warm up. He was wanting to win the tour and he was wanting you to realise he was going to win the tour. And when he left the start house in that time trial with two days to go, boy. And for Andy Schleck, you could see he wasn't up for it He's, because he knew he was up against a totally inspired Cadell Evans. And we could see by the body language of Cadell when he dropped down that little start ramp, this guy was on fire. I was already in Paris and I was, uh, I was in, um, in my bedroom of the hotel where I was going to stay with the team. And I was with uh, another Chiara, Ivan Santaromita's girlfriend, and we were watching the, the time trial together. And I remember I was trying to do a, a math of how many seconds he needed to, um, to get a yellow jersey. Cadell starts two riders ahead of Andy Schleck, who holds a 57 second advantage. The Aussie keen to shift the pressure squarely onto his rival with a simple strategy. Go out fast, do the middle section fast. And finish fast. <laughs> finish, if possible, <laughs> even faster. The early splits show Cadell carving huge chunks out of Andy's lead. I know I kept on calling uh, his coach and say, oh, you sure, you sure? And he said, yeah, yeah, don't worry. Yes, yes, it's going good. It was probably the most exciting tour I've ever done. It came down the wire. We were all on the bus watching the time trial, screaming and yelling. and. It was very emotional. Uh, about 5k to go, the enthusiasm and the, um, like the resonance of the roar of the crowd was sort of what said, oh, I, think, I think this is going pretty well here. John Lelang, the sports director, stopped giving me time, time checks to the, for the stage. I thought, oh, this is, this is something. But then, yeah, the last 5k coming into the finish there, just the depth of the resonance of the cheers that I was getting coming into the final sort of said everything. And then from then onwards, I was just, didn't feel like my feet were touching the ground. Everybody's always asked me over the 39 tours I've reported, uh, which one's my favourite. It's always been 1989, uh, and that was when Le Monde turned the tables on Laurent Fignon in a time trial. Now we could go back to 2011, because it was virtually a déjà vu, that was where Cadell Evans turned the table on Andy Schleck. It wasn't a question of was he going to win, it was a question of by how much was he going to win. Inspired by a lifetime of coming close and falling short, Cadell rides the time trial of his life rocketing through the course to post the second fastest time of the day, some two minutes and 31 seconds quicker than Andy Schleck to seize the yellow jersey by one minute 34. With only the parade ride into Paris remaining, Cadell Evans has effectively won the 2011 Tour de France. Standing up on the podium on the Champs-Élysées, it's not something I'd ever given a great deal of thought to, but... Um, Hadn't yeah. you really? Hadn't thought about it? No, it's not something I think about that often, actually. I'm sort of focused on the, on the process more than the outcome, because to get the outcome, you've got to, you've got to do the process. And, um, but even, not when the race is on, but even when you're dreaming about winning the Tour de France as a kid, or, or you know, when you're away from the race, you don't think about winning? Uh, no, I think about riding a good race. I focus, on the, I focus on the process more than the outcome, which is probably a bit of a pity, because maybe I don't appreciate it as much as, as I could do, but um, standing on the Champs-Élysées there, and there are lots of Australian flags, and you know, Tina Arena coming up, sings the national anthem, and she winked at me, and when she comes up and she starts singing the national anthem, it's... You know, I'll never have a sporting experience like that again. That was wonderful. Um, 
uh, you know, a lot of emotions are, are, are come, come to bear at that, at, those, at, at that time because, you know, um, I knew the kind of efforts that Cadell had put into winning the tour. And so I felt very good for Cadell, uh, Kiara, his family. Um, I felt great for the team because they had worked really hard. And for our sponsor, you know, Andy Reese really put a lot of faith in this project and in me and in Cadell to get the job done. It was a moment for him to enjoy. And I think that, you know, the, the music, the national anthem for Australia, you know, the, the ceremony itself was very moving. It was a great moment for Cadell, a great moment for the BMC team. It's the people that are really, really close to you, who've been alongside you for 10 or 20 years or your, or your whole life. That It's only those people that can really understand and comprehend how much work someone like me puts into a, something like winning the tour. They were just like, I'm so happy for you that it came out well for you. Aldo Sassi received the bouquet of yellow flowers from the podium on his grave the, the day I got home. And um, yeah, and Damien Grundy had got the first yellow jersey. It's those people as a sports person that help you, you know, that point you in the right direction and help you along. Damien Grundy, when I turned up as a 14 year old at his bike shop, oh, I want to be a bike rider, can you help me? I can only imagine there's a combination of a whole heap of different emotions, satisfaction, jubilation, relief. What's the overwhelming one? Satisfaction, I think. A little bit relief, but mostly satisfaction and a job, job well done. What did you expect when you got off the plane in Australia? I really didn't know what to expect. I've been just surprised that, um, and, and really, um, how can I say it? But I was honoured that um, my, my results and my efforts are, are so well appreciated. And yeah, really honoured that people have in, appreci appreciate yeah, what I've put into it and, 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 and I've also enjoyed that. You really wanted to be in Australia after the tour and to thank all the fans and seeing all of those people turning up in Federation Square and St Kilda Road, it was really breathtaking. I know that you've said to me before that sometimes you don't understand the fuss. You know, you're just a guy riding his bike. Why is everybody so preoccupied with it? More quite, than ever now, sorry, I suppose. Quite literally, I'm really just riding my bike and there's all this stuff going on around me and most of it I enjoy. Some of it's like, wait, come on, just stay calm, please. You know, I want to you know, be able to get out of the, off the Champs-Élysées with both my arms attached. To, you know, not, I don't want to lose them to some excited fan who's going to take them home for a souvenir. But, um, but um, yeah, you know, that's what's kept, got me to where I am now and that's what's going to continue driving me in the future. Your coach Eldo Sassi said to you that if you can win the tour you can be a once in a generation rider. Do you feel a, a, some sort of sense of contentment or satisfaction or now you've tasted it you want more? As a person no, I feel exactly the same. Um, like, like for the Worlds, a lot of people said about me that oh the Worlds changed me, I was a different rider then. But um, the thing for me for the Worlds is I stayed exactly the same but everyone around you changes and that's kind of, sometimes it's not real healthy to be honest at a psychological level. And for me it's winning the Worlds or winning the Tour for me, it was a, a stamp of approval for the rider I am, what a, my commitment that I've given to the sport and, and a prize for, 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 for the hard work that I've put in. Have you had any time to think about uh, what this will mean in terms of the longevity of your career? I don't think it will change a lot actually, I already had a pretty ambitious plan in my mind and um, I don't know if Kiara will let me go any longer than those ambitions so it'll probably stay around about the same. We said before the race what would winning the tour in 2011 mean to Cadell and you said I'm not exactly sure. Do you know what the answer is now? I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> That's about the same answer. Cadell Evans winning the Tour de France in 2011. I'm still kind of coming to terms with that myself. Um, that, that, coming to terms with that, with that phrase. Compliments to all my teammates and everyone who helped me. Um, thank you as well to everyone who helped me along the way. We'll come back next year and try and repeat. How are you going to maintain the hunger? Maintain the hunger? It's not a, <laughs> it's not a problem for me. I love riding my bike. I'm really appreciative of this job. I'm just very happy to have the opportunity to make uh, a profession of my of what was my, what was a passion, passion, what was a hobby. And um, my main thing is uh, when I retire, I, I just want to be able to say, look, I gave it everything I could. I was really, I lost a lot of races. I won some races, but I gave it everything I could. And I don't want to, I don't want to have any regrets that should I have trained harder, should I race longer or whatever, whatever. I just want to have any regrets like that when I, when I retire. And so I'll just keep following this line. I don't know what people will think of me, good and bad things, I guess. Um, yeah, I'd like to be remembered as a as a, as a rider who, um, yeah, 
gave his best to his sport and but also to his team and and as a professional i hope i'm remembered as uh, a cyclist who worked hard i was professional gave his all gave his best helping the sport along and developing in, in the right direction and that sports brought me so many great experiences travel meeting people living learning about different cultures and um, yeah the people I've met along the way and the experiences I've had the places I've seen and uh, it's been just uh, an incredible an incredible ride mate congratulations thanks again for your time thank you very much mm -hmm.